I want to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking to you from the unceded territories and homeland of the Ute Nations. This part of what is now called Colorado has also been home to Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne. This land was a center for trade, community building, information sharing, conducting healing ceremonies, and where people live their lives. The United States and other settler colonies work hard to erase the narratives of indigenous peoples. Acknowledging that we reside on the homelands of indigenous peoples is an important step in recognizing the history of the original stewards of these lands. Land acknowledgments serve in a small way to remind us of the contributions and sacrifices indigenous peoples have made. I also want to acknowledge that white supremacy was built on stolen labor and continues to dispossess black and other minoritized people of health, wealth, and humanity. In fact, it is crucial in any decolonizing process that we recognize how we participate in and benefit from oppressive colonizing systems. I hope that comes out in my talk today. I also want to take a moment to thank Cheryl Cookie for what I am sure was an incredibly kind, if not slightly exaggerated, introduction. I realized a long time ago that most people on this planet don't get me. But Cheryl is one of the few people who do. As a result, she has cleared paths for me and included me in spaces I otherwise would have had trouble accessing. Thanks, big sis. I love you. Over the past 20 years since I first joined NASA as a grad student, I could not help but wonder if someday I would become president of this organization and what it would be like giving the presidential address. As I stare into my computer monitor days before the virtual conference and even before the U.S. election, I can say it is everything I ever imagined. It feels like a long time since last year's conference and Dr. Akila Carter Francique's amazing transcendent talk. In my address today, I'd like to use this opportunity to draw together different strands of my research to understand the world we are experiencing now. As Dr. Cornell West recently said, to see clearly so that we better know how to direct our fire. Like, I imagine all of you, I have gazed upon the past year with horror and befuddlement. Being a sociologist, I have tried to make sense of it. And my sense-making has been situated within what I currently study, which is NFL marketing. In this talk, I want to see what the NFL's incorporation of racial justice rhetoric and recognition of state violence against black people can tell us about contemporary white supremacy and racial capitalism. Since I had a hard time deciding where to, so to start, I decided to start with the NFL's 2020 season opener. When the NFL announced that it would perform Lift Every Voice and Sing before the first game of the 2020 season, many people reacted to the announcement as the NFL pandering to black audiences. Of course, it is pandering, but it is also worth taking seriously. For those unfamiliar, Lift Every Voice and Sing became known as the Black National Anthem in the early 20th century after being adopted by the NAACP and endorsed by Booker T. Washington. Performed in black churches and HBCUs amongst ever, other places ever since, it has remained a part of U.S. black culture. The NFL performance of Lift Every Voice and Sing is profoundly ironic and not just because it includes images of Colin Kaepernick. Featuring narration by actor and producer Anthony Mackie and sung by Alicia Keys, the NFL chose the L.A. Coliseum as the site for the performance. The Coliseum might seem like an unusual location for the video, since it's no longer an NFL stadium. However, the L.A. Coliseum is actually a profound site to set the video. In 1972, Stax Records used the Coliseum to host Watt Stax, a fundraiser for the Watts community seven years after the 1965 uprising. The documentary captures the revolutionary essence of the song through a visual montage of images of oppression in a dialectical back-and-forth struggle with images of resistance. The montage begins with images of slavery and Jim Crow racism. It then transi transitions to images of historical leaders, including George Washington Carver, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, and Marcus Garvey. 
It transitions again to more recent images of the police using dogs and fire hoses to suppress civil rights protest, protests, followed again by images of mid-20th century leaders, such as Louis Armstrong, Aretha Franklin, Huey Newton, Malcolm X, and Elijah Muhammad. The live performance of the song is then cut off by Martin Luther King delivering his iconic I Have Been to the Mountaintop speech. If you recall, King's mountaintop speech uh, is irrepressibly optimistic while explicitly anticipating his own assassination that in, ha in fact happened the very next day. The documentary's interpretation of Lift Every Voice and Sing suggests that the song's optimism does not come from leaving white supremacy in the past, but from a relentless struggle against it. If history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as farce, the NFL's version of Lift Every Voice and Sing parodies the politics of the Watt Stacks documentary. The NFL's L Lift Every Voice and Sing video begins with a montage of images and Mackey's narration that establish the U.S. as a nation of freedom and prosperity that black people have been excluded from. Images of hate and intolerance quickly switch to images of beautiful African-American youth smiling directly into the camera. As Alicia King begins to, uh, Keys begins to sing in the L.A. Coliseum, we see images of NFL players engaged in respectful protests, working in communities with children, and educating people in different multiracial settings. The words Black Lives Matter and Breonna Taylor operate as a leap motif in the video. In this way, the video recognizes racism, black struggle, and says her name. Optimism thus results from a linear movement into a better, colorblind future thanks to the efforts of the National Football League and its workers. By situating black resistance in a familiar narrative of nation, the United States is a nation constantly moving towards greater freedom, the NFL video hollows out the dialectical tension between oppression and struggle in the Watt Stack documentary, just as COVID-19 hollowed out NFL stadiums. To add to the, ir the irony, the, the dialectic of oppression and resistance was restored when fans booed Kansas City and Houston players for holding hands in a moment of unity immediately after the video played. The NFL's rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing is structurally similar to the NBA commercial The Truth Is Black Lives Matter that came out earlier in the year. The marketing platform Ace Metric found the truth is earned its highest A score of all BLM themed commercials as of July 2020. Their conclusion, like lots of other advertisers over the past few years, is that socially conscious marketing works. Consumers respond positively to their favorite brands engaging in a politics of recognition and taking stands on behalf of social justice. There are a few key takeaways from the NFL's rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing and the NBA commercial. First, despite narratives of progress, the United States remains a violent, dangerous place, especially for black, indigenous, and other racialized peoples. People's radical activism has an impact that even the most powerful institutions must respond to. The, Washington team in Wa uh, the football team in Washington, D.C. and NASCAR demonstrate this. The colonial response to aspirational social movements are violent, but not purely violent. The attempt to manage people's radical energy will speak to them at the levels of ethics and emotions. This address is very sophisticated and not simply didactic. Indigenous decolonial studies scholars call this a strategy, call this strategy a politics of recognition. Recognizing cultural identities or the recognition of harms purports to move us towards a more just, inclusive society by expanding the realm of citizenship and hence membership in the nation. However, decolonial scholars remind us that this is not a relationship of equals, and therefore we should be skeptical of a politics of recognition that does not challenge the imperialist state. Instead, we might understand this as a colonial governmentality. Before I get into the heart of my talk, I want to take a step back for a moment, in part 
I'd like to introduce myself, since most NASA mem members only know me from emails on the listserv, but also to illustrate what I mean by colonial governmentality. Like many of you, sports studies is very personal for me. I became an athlete and a sports fan because of one person in particular. My father. Football created a medium through which he and I could develop a relationship. Hours upon hours spent watching and discussing football provided a foundation to the relationship we still maintain. However, this is not a story of patrilineal sport descendants. You see, my paternal grandfather was born in Mexico and really wasn't a big football fan when my father was young. Instead, my father was taught football at the Thomas Indian School as a ward of New York State. Originally named the Thomas Asylum for Orphaned and Destitute Indian Children, Thomas was part of the, larger, uh, of the United States' larger shift to gentle, gentle colonization. This is a more accurate representation of the school since it was a functioning dairy farm. Schooling was used to take the children of indigenous nations and convert them into U.S. citizens who would then be routed into the lowest rungs of the working class and the military. The mission of the boarding school, as most of you probably know, was Kill the Indian, Save the Man. This had replaced the older slogan, The only good Indian is a dead Indian. As such, sport, like agricultural labor, was not an option for the boys. They played football in the fall, basketball in the winter, baseball in the spring, and were taken into the chapel to watch boxing matches on the television. Sport was a pleasurable realm of colonial administration. This points to the subjective dimension of colonial governmentality. My father and the boys he played with found great pleasure and empowerment in playing football. It gave them the opportunity to engage in state-sanctioned violence against the settler children that lived all around them. They grudgingly won the recognition of those kids, but it did not challenge settler colonialism. The power and pleasure discovered in football tied their identities to oppressive colonial practices, the state, higher education, and the market. What this means is that because my father brought me into U.S. citizenship, in part through a shared passion for football, colonial governmentality is sedimented in my very soul. This is something I have tried to honor in my scholarship by building a career that critiques football and U.S. imperialism. What I have attempted to do in my scholarship is use imperialism as a central category of analysis through which I have studied sport. I believe using imperialism as a frame of analysis allows me to engage in intersectional analyses that locate identities within political economy and colonial administration. The anti-imperialist frame was present in my first book, Discipline and Indulgence, that used the study of the Cold War to comment on the so-called global war on terror. Beyond a not-so-subtle reference to a certain dead French philosopher, the title attempts to capture the U.S.'s two-pronged foreign policy throughout the Cold War and football's place within U.S. imperialism. The first prong was a military strategy that led to the, indust the military-industrial complex and millions of deaths globally. Discipline is not just important to the military and football, but across different productive institutions, from Fortis manufacturing to schooling. The second prong of U.S. Po foreign policy was the development of consumer culture, from entertainment to kitchen appliances. Whereas the military prong to contain the Soviet Union to limited spheres of influence was violent, the cultural prong gave a, gave a vision of a consumerist utopia embedded in the American way of life. Despite Glasnost and the fall of the Berlin Wall, many aspects of the Cold War never ended, and this is because U.S. imperialism continued unabated. What I hope discipline indulgence shows is militarism and consumerism are twin heads of U.S. imperialism. Militarism immobilizes naked coercive force. Consumerism mobilizes ideological forces that foster identities consistent with the needs of capital and attempts to minimize resistance to capitalist domination as well as soaking up surpluses of mass production. We can understand this through Manning Maribel's statement that capitalism is based on fraud and force. 
Fraud is the ideological force that says freedom and opportunity are only possible within capitalism when that reality is in fact materially impossible to most people. Force emerges when the fraud is revealed and people need to be forced back into line. In sports sociology, we do a very good job of analyzing and critiquing the ideological forces of capitalism, which is, in fact, mostly what I do in this talk. However, we need to remain mindful that militarism is a structural reality of imperialism which makes violence a constant feature of everyday life. As Maribel suggests, fraud and force remain in constant dialectical tension. When discussing governmentalities, it's easy to overlook the violence endemic to imperialism, as Mary MacDonald rightly said about discipline and indulgence. As many NAS scholars have pointed out, the ascendance of neoliberal capitalism in the 1970s has led to increasing levels of exploitation and inequalities. We have simultaneously seen the growth of the prison industrial complex and the militarization of police forces. Throughout this period, race has been a key tool in splitting the working classes. Downward economic mobility of white workers from deindustrialization and the weakening of labor consistently gets blamed on workers colonized within the system. Since at least the 1990s, this has presaged the rise of survivalist and white supremacist groups in the U.S., we cannot view the deaths of George Floyd, Ahmed Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, Vanessa Ginn, and so many others as accidents, coincidences, or otherwise aberrations to an otherwise just system. The fear produced by abstract random violence by the state and vigilantes to whom the state has delegated the right of racial violence is central to the operation of racial capitalism. It stabilizes crises caused by resistance to racial capitalism. Cedric Robinson used the term racial capitalism to argue that racial and economic domination are inseparable, two sides of the same oppressive coin. His larger point is that rather than negate feudalism, capitalism brought feudal racial hierarchies into the political and economic order of the modern world. In other words, in other words, feudal strategies of accumulation were repurposed and updated under new conditions. So just as serfs and Slavs had taken the natural role of slaves in feudalism, people of the global south became natural slaves under capitalist imperialism. Or as I tell my students, racial capitalism puts the system in systemic racism. What we have witnessed this past year is a series of challenges to racial capitalism. Radical black activism is the Achilles heel of U.S. imperialism and white supremacy. The protests in the streets gave athletic activists courage and opportunity to engage in far more radical industrial actions than Kaepernick's iconic protests. When Naomi Osaka, NBA teams, or the University of Missouri football team engage in wildcat strikes for racial justice, they recognize themselves as workers with interests beyond their own personal bread and butter concerns. By withholding their labor power, even if it is only fleeting, it creates labor problems for sporting capitalists. They create a crisis by blocking the movement of capital and hence capitalists' ability to accrue surplus value. Sporting activist protests against state violence in communities of color is fundamentally an attack upon racial capitalism. The NFL has responded to this attack as a publicity crisis in need of management. In other words, the NFL is trying to situate the current crisis within their existing marketing model. The NFL views the protests as militant black workers threatening capital accumulation by alienating large groups of fans. Its response, initially, was highly inconsistent and angered everyone. Since then, the NFL has gotten much more consistent and sophisticated in its marketing. Ultimately, the NFL has integrated black players' protests against state violence into its marketing to form a colonial governmentality. To explain this, I want to back up and explain the NFL's marketing over the past decade or so.
The NFL set the goal of making $25 billion a year by 2027, which meant it would need to aggressively expand its already large, diverse market. However, it faced a raft of external challenges. Conditions the NFL needed to respond to include demographic and economic transformations in society that foster new identity formations, an array of consumer leisure options for people to choose from that compete with watching football, and increased concerns about health in a risk society. Plus, it wanted to expand its market with women since the male market was essentially saturated. Drawing on marketing theories of experience, the NFL developed a powerful emotional marketing strategy. First, with its Together We Make Football campaign, its marketing discourse drew a connection between football, community, and family. Its more recent Football is Family campaign gets to the central pleasurable experience of sports fandom. This implies that football is central to the emotional connections in our families, amongst our friends, and in our communities. It suggests we are all the children of football. Through programs such as USA Football and Heads Up Football, the NFL has argued that the game can not only be made safe through improved techniques and technology, it is actually healthy. Ultimately, the NFL responded to growing competition, changing demographics, increased health concerns, and addressing new market segments by appearing more diverse and inclusive, by offering more entertaining products that have greater production quality, and most importantly with the argument that not only can football be made more safe, it is actually healthy to individuals, families, and communities. The black player players' protests and the conservative reactions to the protests, including tweets and speeches by the U.S. president, disrupted the happy story the NFL was telling. Its reactions were contradictory attempts to appease both its liberal and conservative fans, as well as its mostly black on-field workers, the people whose labor actually generates those billions of dollars. It seemed to constantly switch from a position of tolerance to cracking down on its ungrateful, which is code for uppity, workers. Over time, and especially this year, the NFL has gone beyond a position of tolerance of the protests to incorporating the protests into its spectacle. We should not think that Roger Goodell suddenly woke up to black pain, but understand the shift as a strategic response to both the players' protests and the mass protests in the streets, as well as pressure from sponsors. What I consider the NFL's first step in incorporating the protests was the My Cause, My Cleats initiative. My Cause, My Cleats allowed players to put statements of support for causes of their own choice on their shoes. Generally, these were shout-outs to different nonprofits. My initial reaction was that My Cause, My Cleats attempts to dilute the players' focus on state violence into lots of other good causes. And this incorporates the players' protests into the NFL's existing marketing strategy. It allows them to, to focus on volunteerism in communities. And the NFL and its workers are good for community health. We can, this is visible in NFL communications, such as the ones you see on the slide. Uh, the first one coming from the My Cause, My Cleats webpage, and the second one being a passage from Roger Goodell and Doug Baldwin's letter to the Senate Judiciary uh, Committee. But then I was curious, what sorts of messages players put on their shoes? I found a comprehensive list of the causes that players put on their feet in 2018. 790 players put 805 messages on their 1,580 feet. As you can see, 45% listed physical and mental health causes. These included breast cancer, lupus, brain tumors, suicide, ongoing medical research, and so forth. 27% listed youth welfare causes, and this included mentoring, free breakfast, youth athletics, and more. So almost three-quarters of the causes fall into two categories 
that were not directly related to the players' protests against state violence and instead are more consistent with the NFL's traditional corporate social responsibility marketing. The rest of the categories I developed when coding the messages are listed on the right-hand column. You can see that messages directly related to the protests, police violence, and criminal justice reform only made up 1% of the statements. And within that 1%, several were in support of the Ross Initiative in Sport for Equality that was founded by Miami Dolphins owner Stephen Ross, and that includes former NFL commissioner Paul Tagliabu on its board. So even the messaging of worker activists that wanted to further the protest through My Cause, My Cleats were articulated through NFL messaging and organizations. What the numbers show is that, in fact, My Cause, My Cleats appropriates the radical energy of black NFL players in a feel-good initiative that doubles as NFL marketing. I don't mean to put down any of the foundations or initiatives supported by the players or the players' good intentions. In fact, recognizing players' good works in different communities for different causes is exactly the distraction. Anquan Bolden and Malcolm Jenkins founded the Players' Coalition to work with the NFL on social justice issues. The coalition has some notable accomplishments. The NFL committed to donate $90 million to social justice organizations, and it has lent support for criminal justice reform, as well as connecting unequal health outcomes to racial inequality. There is no question that these are good things and illustrate the power of celebrity activism. But this also begs the question, what is the model of activism? I see the Players' Coalition as an example of what gets called the nonprofit industrial complex, a set of relationships whereby people on the ground doing social justice work get funded by foundations and private corporations via 501c3 status. Small grassroots organizations desperately need funding to do their work, which creates the opportunity for foundations and private corporations to exert control and surveillance over their social justice work. This does not mean the people doing social justice work are not, in, are not sincerely committed or able to do good work, but the very system in systemic racism funds and thus exerts control over the work to dismantle systemic racism, amongst other things. What this means is that the tactical solutions to racial capitalism get organized in a way that does not actually challenge racial capitalism. The Players' Coalition engages in a politics of recognition whereby certain select social justice organizations are recognized and funded by the League for the purpose of racial rec reconciliation. The goal of the nonprofit industrial complex in this particular case, is to put racial violence and the racial get wealth gap in the past, but without dismantling the institutional structures that created the violence and inequality in the first place. This is what Glenn Sean Coulthard calls colonial governmentality, whereby the space of recognition and reconciliation is not a space of freedom and dignity, but a field of power through which colonial relations are produced and maintained. Instead of fostering decolonial subjectivities, it fosters colonized subjectivities to manage the labor and consumption power as well as the land of colonized people. It is why I think Eric Reed accused Malcolm Jenkins of being, quote, a neocolonial sellout. This perspective on colonial governmentality gets us to the Rock Nation NFL Inspired Change Strategic Partnership. When Rock Nation partnered with the NFL, many people immediately called Sean Carter a sellout. Others responded that it was too soon to judge his actions, that he should be given more time to see if he is a sellout or not. Debating whether or not Sean Carter is a sellout is asking the wrong question, since it individualizes Jay-Z's political strategy and reduces his politics to morality and individual intentions. Sean Carter may be an especially effective business person, but he is not unique in political economic philosophy, 
or strategies of action within a society structured by racial capitalism. A way to understanding Sean Carter is through what I consider the best defense of his strategic partnership with the NFL. This line of thinking says that Jay-Z is not a sellout. Instead, he is a pragmatist who acted with political maturity rather than with emotions or idealism. Michael Eric Dyson provided what I think is the best example of the maturity defense. Dyson makes a one-two argument of what he sees as a natural progression of effective social movements. He begins by equating Kaepernick and Jay-Z to Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. He argues that, quote, those pairs reflect an eternal tension, the outside agitator, agitators who apply pressure and the inside activators who patrol the, house, the halls of power, bringing knowledge and wisdom. We don't choose between one or the other, he continues. We need the outsider applying pressure so the insider can get things done. He then pivots to argue that Jay-Z actually reflects not King, but Jesse Jackson, who extended King's activism by suing corporations to achieve civil rights gains. He states, quote, This reflected a shift in civil rights strategy from street protests to sweet participation. Jackson leveraged the threat of boycotts and the rhetoric of persuasion to get more blacks placed on corporate boards, compel banks, and major companies to direct more business to minority-owned contractors and help integrate more black and other minority folk into the nation's economic power base. He then explains, quote, Jay did not write off protests when he said we are past kneeling. He simply cast Kaepernick as a runner in a relay race rather than a boxer fighting alone in the ring. The evidence of, of success that Dyson offers is the amount of money the NFL now donates to social justice causes. While I have already argued how Inspire Change operates within the nonprofit industrial complex, I also want to add that Dyson's defense of Sean Carter indicates a philosophical orientation towards racial justice. As Brenton Mock states, there are those who see justice in terms of truth, fairness, and equity. And then, then there are those who see it in terms of wealth, power, and equity. The latter group tend to be pragmatists impatient with abstract goods like rights and equality. If asked to choose between a Lexus or Justice, they would answer, Justice is forming a partnership with Lexus. In other words, people that Maribel calls opportunists want to use the market to achieve social justice since the problem apparently is a lack of wealth by itself. Buying in becomes what is defined as mature political action. But buying into the system in this situation is using black capitalism as an antidote to racial capitalism. People outside of the United States may not be very familiar with black capitalism. The political and economic philosophy that would eventually get called black capitalism first emerged after the Civil War as a strategy of economic development for freed slaves. In a social context of violent exclusion, that led to the creation of black banks. The idea is to control the flow of black wealth. By keeping black wealth within the black community, it would foster the black community's economic development. A core tenet of black capitalism is investment in black ownership and entrepreneurialism. This is expressed in slogans such as buy black and bank black. It is important to recognize that black ownership and entrepreneurialism goes beyond economic development. It also became a force of community pride and esteem amidst extraordinarily oppressive and stigmatizing conditions. The idea of building parallel institutions that cater to a specific racial or ethnic group in a segregated society is not unique to the black community. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, building racial and ethnic businesses within segregated ghettos was a common response to white supremacy. For instance, how many people have heard of the Bank of Italy? But we need to keep in mind that segregation is not just social, it is also economic, which gets us to the limitation of black capitalism within a virulently anti-black capitalist society. <laughs>
Ethnic Europeans like Jews and Italians became fully white in the 20th century, which allowed them and their capital to leave the ethnic ghetto. And so, the Bank of Italy became the Bank of America, which I suspect everyone is familiar with. Mersa Berederin states, The truth was that segregated communities could not segregate their money. In fact, black banks, which were created to control the black dollar, became the very mechanism through which black money flowed out of the black community and into the mainstream white economy. I want to be clear. My understanding is primarily based on the works of black intellectuals that breaks into two historical periods, the late 60s and early 1970s, and mostly since 2001. The term black capitalism was advanced in the late 1960s by Richard Morehouse Nixon, which I'll come back to in a moment, but black scholars were highly critical of it at the time. In particular, Andrew Brimmer, who was no radical, argued that black capitalism was doomed to, strip to failure for structural reasons. We then see a renewed interest in black capitalism following Robert Re Weems' work in 2001 that showed Nixon saw black capitalism, uh, black radicals, excuse me, as an internal threat to national sovereignty during the Cold War. And so he offered black capitalism as a means of pacifying radical black activism. Essentially, a socialist black power movement was rearticulated as black, uh, black capitalism. This, this shifted the focus from the state's obligation to underdeveloped communities to private enterprise and individual entrepreneurialism. It allowed some activists to buy into the system and opened up racial justice work to business people. The critique of black capitalism, whether practiced by John H. Johnson, Roy Innes, or Sean Carter, begins with E. Franklin Frazier. The black bourgeoisie supports black capitalism since it minimizes white competition and allows them to achieve market capture. Black pride and sol solidarity get mobilized to serve the economic needs of the black bourgeoisie. When the black power movement was rearticulated as black capitalism, it moved the politics of black activists into the hands of black business people. Black activism was then shifted to black consumerism. Further, it is predicated on highly destructive racial stereotypes. Specifically, it presumes black people lack financial literacy or discipline and therefore do not use their wealth wisely. Just think of Jay-Z's song, The Story of O.J. Unsupported by financial data, the stereotype pathologizes, individualizes, and distracts from the operation of white supremacy. Ultimately, black capitalism does not address the structural problems that create black poverty and anti-black violence. At its best, it shifts more black money into, few, into a few black pockets. Viewing inspired change through the frame of the nonprofit industrial complex and black capitalism clarifies how it operates within a colonial governmentality. It shifts the obligation of the state to undo its harms, conquest, slavery, segregation, etc., onto small nonprofits and small businesses. It provides solutions consistent with the logic of capital to overcome problems of its own creation. Funding allows the NFL to present concern about racial justice while insulating itself from political challenges. And Sean Carter offers a symbol of authenticity an image of radical blackness within a strategy of black capitalism. Fred Hampton argued, the greatest threat to U.S. imperialism is a multiracial socialist solidarity movement. For this reason, capitalists inside and outside of the NFL have every reason to fear the current wave of racial justice activism, and especially the activism of black professional athletes. Without a doubt, 
the imperialist state continues to use violence as a means to stabilize crises in racial capitalism. But naked violence does not effectively respond to the moral claims of racial justice activists calling attention to the immorality of state violence. And this is the role of entertainment like professional sports. It obscures the militarism of U.S. imperialism by focusing on the pleasures of consumerism. But that also empowers radical black athletes. When professional sports leagues are dependent upon black, black workers, who often come from communities pinched in the vice-like grip of white supremacy, they have the ability to challenge the consumerist illusion. The NFL and other leagues are now working very hard to restore the illusion. Whether it's pre-approved social justice statements, playing Lift Every Voice and Sing alongside the Star Spangled Banner, or providing limited funding for nonprofits doing the work that the state should be doing, they engage in a politics of recognition rather than decolonial practice. Hiring black entrepreneurs like Sean Carter provides a sheen of authentic blackness on old practices. Like my father teaching me to love gridiron fo football, this is a kind of colonial governmentality, whereby the liberatory energy of ra radical black politics is routed into the very system in systemic racism. As Manning Maribel reminds us, there is no path to liberation within, ca within capitalism and imperialism. As I wrote the previous slide to conclude my talk, I wondered what paths outside of capitalism are available to us. So I turned to the theme of this year's conference, Change Agents and W.E.B. Du Bois. It turns out Du Bois, among many other African-American intellectuals, including A. Philip Randolph, Marcus Garvey, E. Franklin Frazier, Nanny Helen Burroughs, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and John Lewis, all advocated for black cooperatives. That discovery led me to Jessica Gordon Nembhard's incredible book, Collective Courage, A History of Af African American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice. Nembhard shows that there is a buried history in the United States of black people organizing collectively and cooperatively to not just survive white, white supremacy, but to prosper. While well, organizing collectively does not have to be anti-capitalist, it often is, because it is fundamentally about community empowerment and solidarity. It pools the community's wealth to overcome barriers. It provides a means of keeping the, work, the, the wealth workers generate in the hands of workers. And it fosters workplace democracy. I see this as a subject for further research, since the idea of sports cooperatives is fairly new to me, although I am familiar with the Green Bay Packers, and I could not find much research on sports cooperatives. I do see this as a useful focus for further research, since a successful global cooperative movement already exists, it is consistent with indigenous and traditional economic organization, it can chart a non-capitalist path, and not only are sports already cooperative, but sports cooperatives could foster healthier forms of sport, such as what Jay Coakley calls people sport, or other models of sport outside the dominant elite model. So hopefully, I will be able to talk to you about successful sport cooperatives in the future. Thank you so much for taking this time to listen to my talk, and I look forward to a productive conversation with you.